Our next speaker is one that I've got a lot of experience with. Uh, Nate Warfield and I were previously in MSRC together. Um, Nate, I came back to Microsoft. They pulled me into MSRC, so like coming out here, careful, they'll pull you back, man. Um, <laughs> but uh, I can honestly say Nate and I have been up to mostly no good in multiple continents together. And I think he's going to be a, uh, a great speaker for you. Uh, if you could get him up for uh, Nate Warfield with Eclipsium for Zero Day Firm Juarez. Thank you, Jason. Uh, thank you for catching the joke. Uh, it probably dates me to use a term like zero day whereas, but before there was exploits, there was IRC channels and zero day whereas where you got pirated software the day that it came out. So that's the pun here. Louder? All right, I can do that. All right. Um, so I'm Nate. Um, I worked at Microsoft for about seven years. Uh, I worked at MSRC. Um, my specialty is hacking things that pass packets. Um, this is my eighth blue hat. Uh, the last time I was a blue hat was almost a year ago today uh, in Israel before the world shut down. Um, I don't use social media much, but it's there. Um, and I don't really want to talk about myself too much. What I want to give you is a little bit of background as to why I did this talk. Um, normally what I do is I find something that I'm an expert in, and then I do a bunch of research, and I try to have this expert opinion and use all of this cool stuff that you're like, wow, this guy knows everything about a load balancer and how to hack it. This time I wanted to do something different. So what I did was take something that I'm still learning a lot about, which is firmware, and take it from the perspective of if I'm somebody who's in an organization who knows nothing about this, what information can I share with you that will help you better understand the risks that you have, better understand your attack surface, and hopefully maybe be able to even do some like analysis yourself that helps mitigate your risk. So with that in context, Let's get going. Um, my agenda is we're going to just talk about like firmware 101 so we can level set uh, what I'm talking about. I found a remarkably large number of people don't really get, they're like, what is firmware? Is that like a Raspberry Pi? Is that like my home router? Well, yes, and a lot more. Um, I'm going to talk about some attack trends, go into a series of different implants and backdoors that cover different types of firmware. Um, I'm going to talk about some vulnerabilities that my team at Eclipsium found last summer um, against a very top of the food chain uh, supplier of firmware. And uh, then we're going to talk about how to do some of this analysis yourself, some of the tools you can use, uh, the caveats, um, and then uh, some of the challenges that are found with analyzing firmware at scale. And then I'll show you some of the horrible things that I found as I was doing this research and probably close with a not super positive, everything is on fire and it's not gonna get any worse uh, takeaway. So, I'm not known for being super positive about technology, I don't know about you, but security doesn't seem to be getting that much better. Um, but we all have jobs, right, forever. Anyways, so firmware, uh, when we're talking about firmware in your computer, um, you probably understand that your chips have microcode, right, Spectre and Meltdown, we all heard about that. Um, what most people don't realize is that there's anywhere from six to eight different tiny computers inside your computer, and each one of these things runs its own little mini operating system, right? So your CPU will have it, your BIOS has it, your network cards, your storage controllers, your video display adapters, the USB stick that you plug into your computer has firmware on it, right? There's probably more firmware in the world than there is regular computing operating systems. As I'm standing here, there's firmware here, there's firmware there, there's firmware there. And the light control systems might have firmware, I don't know. Um, so that's the sort of end user computing firmware. It's more than that, right? So nowadays, um, I've started to categorize and we, uh, Eclipsium has started to categorize firmware is really anything that controls a device that's not like your operating system, right? It is an operating system, but it's purpose built to do a thing. Um, so your routers, your switches, most of your networking devices, your access points. Um, I threw IoT in here because uh, IoT. Um, but what we're finding is that your commodity stuff, right, it's generally Linux, it's BusyBox, it's still firmware. It's not something you can just go and like apt-get install something with a Debian package like a regular Linux OS. And then as we start getting into the big heavy iron routing stuff that I used to work with in my previous life, um, companies like Cisco and Juniper have started moving to this hypervisor model where there's actually a hypervisor running inside your switch. Uh, and then on top of that is the firmware that's controlling your, you know, 100 gig cards or your, you know, SSL card offloaders or what have you. Um, and Microsoft has even gotten into this, right? You may have heard of the Sonic operating system, which is an open project between Microsoft, Google, Facebook, and a bunch of hardware companies. Um, and it's a Linux-based operating system, but it's designed to drive data center switches, right? All of this is firmware. Um, and unfortunately, because where it lives, 
um, all of the cool security tooling that Microsoft and Sentinel One and everybody builds can't really see it, right? It can kind of see it, but it can't really do anything with it. And then, did I just lose my slides? Oh, there we go. We're back. Yes, firmware. Somebody doesn't want me to tell you about this stuff, right? See, our lives rely on it and you don't even realize it. Um, I only have one. Oh, look at that. Somebody is definitely hacking into these TVs. Okay, I have one. That's all I need. Um, and then the firmware that I wanted to look at for this research was stuff that I consider enterprise systems, right? Having been a network engineer, working with data centers all the time, there's all these things that exist in a data center, right? Your PDUs, your power strips on your racks, you've got IP keyboard video mouse systems, um, your terminal servers, your serial adapters, security controls, you know, everything as you badge in, there's firmware on that thing, there's cameras, there's fire suppression, there's environmental controls. I found some really cool systems that you can download firmware for. Um, like uh, toxic gas detection systems and then like a uh, fuel mixing uh, firmware for controlling diesel generators. I was like, that's cool. Um, but anyhow, so firmware is everywhere. That's kind of what you need to take from that. Uh, and then we're going to get into the attack trends. And uh, I will slow down a little bit. Some people tell me I speak really fast. My daughter tells me, you don't speak fast, Daddy. Everybody else just listens slow. Um, so <laughs> uh, no offense to you here. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, so. The thing with firmware that's interesting is that because it's so low in the operating system or on the, on the platform, you can pretty much persist indefinitely. Um, if I'm in your firmware and you don't know it, you can replace most of the, you can replace your hard drives, you can replace, you know, you get ransomware, most people are just going to swap the drives out. Um, if you don't pay the ransom, you say, throw a bunch of new hard drives in. If I'm in UEFI or if I'm in your baseboard management controller, like I'm still there and I can come back and I can do it again. Um, this stuff is obviously very highly privileged. It's running below the kernel. It's running below Windows. Some people call it like ring minus three. Um, I don't do the rings thing. Um, but it's not updated a lot, right? You don't have a Windows update mechanism to go and say, I've got 100,000 servers in a data center. I need to go update my ILO software. You can't just push it out with Windows update, right? Uh, and there's also the concern is if this goes wrong, like have you, you know, you update your computer, sometimes it's like, hey, I need to do a BIOS update. Do not unplug your computer while this is happening. Have you ever tried doing that and seeing what happens? <laughs> it's not good, I can tell you that is not good. Um, so you don't want that to happen on 100,000 servers in your data center, right? If something screws up, like you have physically bricked the device. So most people don't update stuff here unless they absolutely have to. This was historically the realm of APTs, sandworms, your GRUs, the <coughs> NSA, um, because it was hard to get into, because people weren't looking for it. Uh, now, uh, if you go on GitHub, there's a lot of open source tooling that lets you get to firmware. There's all sorts of uh, stuff to look at, like low-level kernel drivers, stuff to program spy flash, um, stuff to mess around with the microcode settings on your CPUs. Like this open source is great, um, except that it's making, it's lowering the bar of, of technical complexity to your average cyber criminals, right? And so now, um, as I'm going to talk about in a minute, what used to be a Sandworm NSA thing is now a Conti thing. It's now a Ryuk thing. Like, cyber criminals have realized the same thing that the nation states did, which is if I can get in there, I can stay there forever. Um, and then, of course, the depressing thing uh, is that all of these vulnerabilities that were 20 years old that we've stopped having a problem with, like buffer overflows and stack overflows and all of these stuff that we fixed in operating systems, right, with stack canaries, with ASLR, none of that really exists in firmware, right? There's reasons. It's resource constrained. These are usually very small processors, uh, limited amounts of memory. So doing ASLR may not be feasible, but what that means is that once you're on the device or once you've, you've gotten access to it, it's not really that hard um, to exploit it. So here's kind of a timeline of uh, firmware attacks, and this isn't all of them, but this is some of the more interesting ones. Um, I'm not going to go through every single one of these. What I want the feedback, firmware, OK. Um, the interesting part about this is the way that they're accelerating, right? So we go back to 2011. Um, we see then there's hacking team. Obviously, the NSA had their stuff going on. Lojax has been talked to ad nauseum, I, ESET did it best. Um, but then as we started to get into the 2020s, right, we're seeing, okay, a couple things in 2020, we've got a couple things in 2021, we've got four things in 2022, right? Um, and we're starting to see, and I don't know, yeah, you can kind of read this. So December 2020, TrickBoot, right, the TrickBot uh, banking Trojan started adopting abilities to look at BIOS, which we'll talk about in detail here. Um, and then the more interesting one was in October of last year, this Black Lotus thing came out. And 
basically a cyber criminal or somebody had posted on a exploit site saying, hey, I have this universal bypass um, for secure boot. I can get into the UEFI. I can persist in Microsoft and everybody can't catch it. Um, they only wanted five grand for it. And I don't know anybody that bought it to see if it was legit. So we kind of in the industry don't know if this was just um, some script kitty trying to make a quick buck or maybe it was somebody that actually had it. Um, I feel like if they had it, they would have sold it for a lot more based on what you can do with it. But um, if anybody has a sample, come see me afterwards. I'd love to talk to you. Um, so that's sort of the, the attack trends. And then what I wanted to do um, was going off of what little sort of publicly known, not really little publicly known, but the, the easily available stuff. So CISA, or CISA, depending on how you like to pronounce it, started tracking known exploited vulnerabilities. Um, I like this list in the sense that it gives people an idea of what's being exploited. I do think that it's a little bit misleading in that these are not the only things being exploited. These are basically just the stuff that's severe enough that CISA, CISA wants the US government agencies to patch it in a certain amount of time. Um, so this list is a lot of uh, CVS, CSV or JSON data, but I wanted to go through and say, well, what kind of by category is being exploited, right? Because all they do is tell you a software package and a vendor and a bunch of other statistical information. Um, so I went through and I categorized everything, just, you know, and I was marking in firmware is generally, a lot of this is router stuff. Um, some of it is some, some low-level uh, low level system vulnerabilities. But by and large, um, what we're seeing, at least in the last four-ish years, is that attacks against firmware have become one of the most commonly, um, most commonly done, at least from where the government is seeing things. Um, the other sort of uh, caveat to this is that this list isn't great for real-time information because like they, when they started this in 2022, they were looking back in time. So there's obviously stuff that was way before 2022 that's being exploited. I would expect that as the you know, months and years grow on, that you know, 2021 vulnerabilities, 2022 vulnerabilities will continue to be exploited more as people figure out how to exploit them. Um, but it was interesting to me to realize, OK, so here we are you know, looking at the last four years, and firmware is becoming one of the most attacked things. Um, but we're all still more worried about phishing. We're worried about you know, SP, any SP negotiation vulnerability that I want to know about in Windows. Um, I don't get his visibility into cool stuff like I did in MSRC, so I just have to sit and comment to myself, like, that looks fun. I wonder what it is. So with that in mind, the takeaways here is that it's, you know, it's becoming attacked. Ransomware groups are doing it. Um, what I want to get into is some of the implants that we're starting to see. Um, we're not starting to see some of the stuff that's being found, and it's not getting a lot of publicity, I think mostly because if you're not in firmware security, even before I did this job, I didn't really pay much attention to it, right? I was more interested in, you know, networking attacks. I was more interested in, you know, MS-1710. Um, but Kaspersky found this, or I should say they rediscovered this last year. Um, and it's a, it's a piece of UEFI malware. Um, it was actually discovered by, we believe, by Chihu uh, out in China five years previously. Um, nobody really noticed it because it was on a Chinese website and most people don't read Chinese. So like, I don't, maybe it was commonly known out there, but Kaspersky, I, the first we'd heard of it. Um, but what this did was it replaced what's called a DXE driver in the UEFI system. Now, without going too deep in the weeds, UEFI is part of your boot process and essentially it loads up different drivers that lets the operating system talk to components. So like it says, okay, I'm gonna, this is how you talk to the video card and it provides this access to do things. So what they did was they swamped out a, a DXE driver, um, and this thing, as the machine boots up, was able to sort of interrupt the boot sequence, hook the kernel, load itself into running kernel memory before Windows had fully started up. So now you've got this piece of malicious code running inside the Windows kernel um, that is invisible to EDR, right? And nobody, it's, it's not really present on the physical disk. It's in a different portion of the disk. Um, and once it's there, it would just, then it calls out to its C2, it pulls down its secondary payload. Um, it's kind of unknown how prevalent this is. Uh, we put a detection in. We haven't seen it in any of the tens of thousands of, of uh, customer endpoints that we see. Um, Kaspersky won't tell me how many they've seen. Um, they were nice enough to give me a sample of it, though. Uh, so this, but it's probably more specific to China just because it's Chinese actors and that's been discovered on machines only in China. We haven't seen it in the U.S. But this is sort of your end user, you know, your, your, your desktop machine um, type of implant. Going into more cyber criminal stuff, 
Um, what we have is the TrickBot banking trojan, which I'm sure everybody has probably heard of TrickBot. Um, so this has been used for a bunch of years. It's been used against banking companies. Um, it's been delivered using the Emotech campaign, and it's started to be morphed into using it as a, as a Ryuk ransomware delivery mechanism. In 2020, um, like my, my company and another company discovered that TrickBot had started to build in UEFI um, BIOS capabilities into their malware. Um, what this thing was doing was basically checking for write protections in BIOS um, and saying, okay, is this thing, is the write protection turn on or off? You would be surprised or maybe not surprised how many systems um, don't have write protection set, which means if you, have the, if you haven't set the write protection, protection bit, um, I can write malicious code into your BIOS. Um, what this thing so far had, is the capabilities it had at, at that point, was just the ability to read, write, and erase your firmware, which is somewhat in the prototype stage. There wasn't any, like, we can ransomware you from the BIOS at this point, but it's sort of laying the groundwork for a ransomware group to add other functionality uh, into their malware. Um, some of the things that make this tricky, though, is, it's, is because of how firmware differs between manufacturers, um, you know, every component is slightly different and every manufacturer does it a slightly different way, even between firmware versions of the same platform. Um, this is, has to be sort of more, you know, bespoke, uh, organic, you know, farm to table raised malware because you can't just write one payload and have it work on every motherboard in the world. You have to say, okay, I'm going after Gigabyte or Asus with Cosmic Strand, and then you write your implant to work against that specific, you know, hardware manufacturer. So, that's probably one of the reasons that this hasn't become super prevalent is that it's, it's time consuming. And as we know, ransomware groups, you're not gonna spend a bunch of time doing this when you can still fish your way to a payday. Um, but it is saying that they're, they're looking at it, right? And this one was interesting too, um, because it uses this uh, read, write everything driver, which I believe is a GitHub project that you can go and download. Um, it uses this to actually get access to the BIOS. And that same driver uh, is what Lojax and Slingshot used. So, kind of coming back to this fact of open source tools, while they are great, are now making this stuff easier for, you know, it's sort of Legos of, of bad things, right? I mean, I'm not gonna get into the discussion of whether offensive security tooling should be released or not. That's a, that's a, that's a thing I don't touch. But it's still letting people get this kind of access. Um, and I'll, that's enough about that. ILO bleed, so that's right there is sort of your more you know, we're going from your, your user desktop type of, of malware to maybe your desktop and, and possibly server infrastructure malware um, to ILO bleed. And ILO bleed is a specifically server type of malware of, of firmware implant. Um, for the uninitiated, ILO is integrated lights out. Uh, it's a Hewlett Packard technology. Basically what it is is there's a separate processor with its own network card on the motherboard of a server and this thing is always on. You can't turn this off unless you physically unplug the power from the machine, right? You shut down windows, the whole thing shuts off. ILO is still running. It's designed for lights out management. You can connect to your server from a thousand miles away. Um, you can remotely mount media to this thing. You can look at the keyboard and mouse. You can install windows. You can install firmware updates. What these folks did was, unfortunately, ILO security is woefully bad, um, and a lot of these things get exposed to the internet. Um, this graphic here is a statistic from Shodan. Um, it looks like there's, their internet exposure is going down, but it, you know, there was 30-something thousand of them a few months ago that were on the internet. What they were doing was essentially just going in and um, basically overriding the, the ILO code with their own malware, this was kind of cool because they did it very elegantly in that um, once it was infected with ILO bleed, if you as an administrator tried to go and patch it, you said, okay, I'm gonna install the next version of ILO, the malware would be like, cool, patch is installed. It wouldn't actually install the patch. It would continue to be infected and you would have no idea. Um, it also would uh, infect the bootloader of this device, so it was more designed as a, as a data wiper than any sort of um, like persistent access thing. Um, but it would, uh, and then it would disable the security tools, it would disable logging, it even changed the, uh, the login banner. Um, so if you upgraded it and it, you were used to ILO version three and you tried to upgrade it to ILO four, it would give you the ILO four login page while it wouldn't, hadn't actually upgraded the ILO software, right? So this is now, we're moving to this sort of server grade stuff. 
Um, this is how you take out a data center, right? You can wipe the entire device and pretty much brick all of these servers using this malware, and people keep plugging it into the internet. Um, this is some research that I did last year. Um, you know, going from, from desktops to hybrids to servers to the networking side, um, and it was interesting watching the Mystic talk previously because they were talking about some of the ways that these, these APTs are getting in using network devices, using IoT. Um, it was a Mandiant piece of research that got my eye on this, um, a group they call UNC3524, who they believe is Russian, cyber criminal, possibly affiliated with Sandworm. I don't, attribution is kind of just like looking at you know tea leaves at this point. Um, but it was interesting to me because they were attacking load balancers. And in my former life as a network engineer, um, I, was, I worked for F5. I, when I came to Microsoft, I was deploying thousands of these things, so I know it very well. And my thought process was, how can I persist on one of these devices like indefinitely? Um, this threat group didn't have a very elegant series of, of implants. They couldn't get them to keep stay running. They put in web shells so they could go restart their implants when they stopped working. So I was like, I can probably do better, and I did. Um, I used, uh, shout out to Sliver for the second time today. Um, I used Sliver on these things and was able to figure out a way to basically burrow this stuff inside the firmware of a load balancer so that it would keep running after a reboot, it would keep running through a patching, it would keep running through an upgrade. Um, I could in fact infect people's backup files of their configs. Um, so I thought it was pretty fun. And then I did it for Citrix too because I was like, you know, I'm equal opportunity hacker here. Um, these things were kind of cheating because they gave me full shells. Um, the mention of Fortigate is interesting. Fortigate doesn't really give you a full shell, so it's not, it's harder to do. I kind of got tired of doing this after a few months and didn't really get into Fortigate. But pretty much anything that has a full shell is probably capable to do this. I think Juniper is. I don't have a Juniper device. Once again, if you have one, I can play with. Find me afterwards. I promise I won't break it too badly. I did know how to use them too, so I can probably fix it for you. Oh, sorry. Um, if you want to hear more about this, uh, I spoke at Echo Party last November. Um, you can find it on, on, uh, on YouTube. Um, it was super fun. Uh, one of my favorite pieces of research I've done to date. So let's switch gears a little bit to AMI Megarack. Um, AMI Megarack is a firmware that runs the baseboard management controller on millions of servers that are deployed around the world. Um, Baseboard management controllers are essentially like the ILO systems I was just talking about. Um, they give you full platform management. Most of these things have either IPMI connectivity or a new hotness is the Redfish API, which is somewhat of an industry standard um, for managing um, low-level hardware components and sort of out-of-band management for enterprise servers. Um, it lets you monitor the hardware. Um, it lets you do all the power stuff. Uh, it gives you logging and alerting. It's actually a very comprehensive piece of software. I've read a bunch of their, a couple of their user manuals. Like this thing is very powerful. Um, and also because of where it sits, right, this uh, block diagram is really showing you um, where this thing lives on a motherboard. Um, A-Speed is one of the vendors that makes uh, BMC chips and they, um, Megarack runs on tons of A-Speeds. Um, it also runs on other um, hardware components that I can't quite remember. Um, but what's important to note about this is as we are in, there's a lot of talk in the industry now about supply chain security and you know, software bills of materials and where are we getting our technology from. When we discover these vulnerabilities, this is AMI, American Megatrends. If you had a computer in the 1980s, you probably saw it boot up and said AMI BIOS. Like it's the same company. They've been around for 30 something, 40 years. So they are what we would call a very top of the food, food chain supply uh, vendor. They don't sell this code directly to end users. They sell Megarack um, somewhat as like a, as a, almost like an SDK or just a software library. They sell it to OEMs. And then the OEMs take this code, they put it into their firmware update, they deploy it on their servers, and then they sell it to you as an end user. You cannot get, as an end user, a software patch from AMI for this, uh, this code you have to wait for your vendor to build it into their code and then give it to you. So this creates this huge delay in the ability of, or the, the timeline of getting these patches out to people. But the interesting thing is how did we find this? Um, as I mentioned, ransomware groups are becoming very interested in firmware and they're becoming very interested in leaking company data. So back in the summer, uh, we were tipped off to a, a large repository of leaked uh, company information. 
um, that the Ransom X, uh, ransomware group had been uploading to the internet, or to the dark web, I should say. Tor, I hate the concept of dark web, I'm sorry. Um, so we started digging around, uh, and what we found was a couple of suppliers um, that worked with AMI. Um, as we downloaded an exorbitant amount of data, have you ever tried to download something like 50 gigs of data off of Tor? It is obscenely painful. We had to write our own Python script that would do checksums. It took three of us a month to download all of the pieces of data that had put together this data leak. But once we did, as we started digging around, we realized they had a bunch of AMI's intellectual property in there. Um, so we started digging around in there and looking for um, you know, what could we find that might be uh, exposed and hackable and decided if it's remotely accessible, let's target that. We started looking at Redfish. Um, and in the process, we found some default user creds. We found ways to do command injection. Um, and then we disclosed it to them. And in December of last year, um, they released a bunch of patches. I will say that AMI was very cool about working with us. Having been on the other side of the disclosure process in MSRC, um, I know how challenging it can be to work with folks. They were really, really grateful that we came to them and told them about this, um, more than I was expecting. I was kind of expecting a little bit more friction, um, especially when we told them how we found it. <laughs> um, we're like, hey, one of your partners lost some stuff and we found it, um, but it actually went really well. So what we came out was uh, arbitrary code execution. Um, it was CVS 9.9. We found default credentials for a sysadmin user. Um, we were able to enumerate user accounts um, using the API. Um, and then we actually found, kind of coming back to this supply chain issue, we found uh, an RCE in the QDecoder library that Megarack was using. Now, the QDecoder maintainer had fixed this in June of, I think it was June of 2020, they'd actually patched this. But because of this whole supply chain problem, AMI hadn't taken this fix into their version of Megarack. Um, and we were testing against, uh, it was a gigabyte device with a July Rev firmware that had these vulnerabilities, is how we, we RC or um, proof of concept it. Um, we worked, ended up working with CISA and US CERT because we were like, we'd never seen anything that was possibly or potentially this huge just because of its uh, AMI. Um, and so in this process, we did a bunch of scanning on Shodan. We surprisingly didn't find much. I think we found maybe a thousand devices, um, which you know, is, is, a, is nothing in, in the grand scheme of things. Um, the problem that we had is that there's a good chance that we missed a lot. Now, when you get this software from AMI, you're not required to keep their branding on it. So if I'm Dell and I want to use this and I want to slap my web interface on it and take out the AMI copyright information and change the SSL certificate numbers, my scanning tools that we built won't catch that. Right? We only knew what a mega rack branded system looked like. Um, so there's probably a lot of false negatives. On the plus side, um, if people are doing things right, most of the exposure should be inside your data center and not outside your data center. Although I talked to somebody in Asia a couple months ago and they laughed in my face when I told them that most people don't connect to this to the internet, which was unnerving. Uh, most people don't like to admit that and he straight up laughed at me. So. Um, but the thing here is, the, the takeaway is, while this may be a big risk inside your data center, when we look at the fact that I probably am not going to be able to update this, um, I'm not going to want to update this, uh, if I get into your administrative backend network and you've got you know, your big subnet with all your routers, switches, BMCs, ILOs, now I've got an unpatched ODE. And this is, I'm not showing the POC because this is, it is trivial. Um, like a high school CTF hacker could have probably figured out how to do this. It was not great. Um, but we don't have any knowledge of exploitation. We worked with Gray Noise before we released the advisory. We put, they, they deployed signatures. So far, we haven't seen anybody indiscriminately throwing the attack payload. Um, but again, I don't think this is the type of thing people would throw this uh, indiscriminately at. It's also not super easy to get the next stage on a BMC, right? These attackers are used to doing things like, you know, spraying for, you know, Atlassian or spraying for Log4j. You know, once they get on it, they're kind of like, okay, this is a, oh my God, this is a Unix system. I know this. Um, but when you're talking about baseboard controllers, it's kind of this weird black box, and you can't just go download it from a Linux repository. Um, you have to either have a system, or maybe you can kind of hack around with like the OpenBMC project and, and get an idea of how it's working, but it's very hard to develop your second stage payload if you're your sort of lazy cyber criminal script kitty. Um, once again, it's, it's still there. And then 
this is all the companies that have to date released advisories. Um, the other thing that's challenging about this is that AMI told us when we tell our customers about this and we deliver them the patch, nobody's required to tell us if they're vulnerable. Um, so it's not like many of these server vendors are going to stick their hand up and say, yeah, we have a whole bunch of platforms that are affected. Um, we've just had to wait as they released advisories addressing it. Um, I was actually kind of surprised to see NetApp on there. Um, we did some reconnaissance to try to figure out what of all the companies use this. We never came across NetApp, but apparently NetApp filers uh, use this as their baseboard controller. And then the, the last part that makes this complicated is that we don't know uh, how many of these things are deployed, right? Are there 10,000 of these in the world? Are there 10 million of these things in the world? Um, you know, we don't have any information or access to sort of sales statistics from these companies to know what's the real blast radius, right? We, we think it could be probably hundreds of thousands, but more than likely it's millions. Um, we won't know until something happens, right? And then, okay, and then in January, um, we had two more that AMI asked us to delay disclosure on. Um, one of them was not super interesting. It was a password reset. Uh, we could sort of social engineer someone, and if they reset a password, uh, we didn't actually really need to use um, the OTP code. We could just sort of get in in the time window before they reset it and reset their password for them. Um, and then we found them using weak password hashing. So. The first three were really cool. These are still Vulns. Um, I wish that the guy that I have that found these could be here. Uh, unfortunately, he's stuck in this city called Dnipro, um, and they can't really leave right now. So shout out to him. So with that in mind, I decided let's see how I, as a not firmware god guy, I mean, I don't pull, I pull firmware off of a device with hardware things one time. I took Joe Fitz's class at the last Seattle Blue Hat, actually. Um, and we pulled firmware off of little Zytel routers. Um, but that's not something that most people are going to have the time to do in their job. So there exists a couple of cool open source projects that allow you to do firmware analysis fairly automated. Um, you don't have to dump this thing off via like a, a spy or a, a JTAG interface and then try to bin walk the firmware and then try to do all these other things. You can basically just set up a VM and then upload your firmware image to it and let this thing just run all of this automated analysis for you. Um, so FACT is the first tool that I started using. Um, it's from, I think, the correct, don't hate me on the pronunciation, Fraunhof or Fraunhofer Institute out in Switzerland, I believe. Um, but it's, it's very comprehensive. You'd really just basically spin up a really big VM. Um, I was running 12 cores and 32 gigs of RAM. Um, and then you just turn this thing on and you upload it. It will crack passwords that it finds. It will take apart the, the binary image and do a software bill of materials. It'll cross-reference which CVEs affect those different components. Um, it can do CWE, um, so common weakness some things, um, to see if you're using you know, lack of stack canaries or um, you know, what we see using uh, stir copy or you know, the, the bad C coding stuff. I'm not a programmer either. but. Um, so and you can also have it emulate things in QEMU. It'll try to run it. You can, might be able to sort of poke at it and see what it's doing. Um, and it's fairly fast. It has a nice web interface. Um, I like it. It's, it was sort of just, I would just fire and forget, throw a bunch of images up, and come back the next day and see what they'd done. Um, the other one, uh, and this one's really cool. Um, if anybody wants to take a picture of me, I promise the guy who makes this tool, I'd send him one. Um, but I met this guy in Germany, and he is, uh, he built what's called EMBA, and this is a very similar project to FACT, um, but it's kind of along, more along the, like, really, like, nitpicky, configurable, like, Linux geek thing, and I am a full-fledged Linux geek, I will admit that. Um, I don't run Gen 2, though. Uh, <laughs> So you can, it's all, and the, fun, the thing that I think is fun about this is it's a bash script. It's a gigantic bash script that ties all of these different tools together. Um, but because of that, it's a CLI. Um, it doesn't have a database backend. Um, it does have more tests than fact runs. He's basically taken everything in the kitchen sink um, and dumped it into this tool. Um, it uses the known exploited vulnerability information from CISA to tell you, hey, there's a vulnerability in this library, and it's also known to be exploited. Um, it also does referencing against like exploit DB, so it can tell you, hey, this is a vulnerability. We know it's exploited. Here's the exploit for it, right? So it gives you a lot of more contextual information of, you know, we look at a vulnerability and we say, oh, okay, it's got this Linux kernel vulnerability. It's a CVSS 9.8. Is there an exploit for it? No, I don't really care, right? As if we're, we're talking low-hanging fruit here. If it's got an exploit, that's what I care about. 
Um, and it also finds some of the things that fact occasionally misses. So I was, I was running sort of them in conjunction. Um, I, unfortunately, I think I broke my, my server. Um, it started randomly rebooting and locking up about a month into this, so I don't know if I wore something out. So I didn't get to do as much Emba research as I wanted. Um, but one of the funny things that I found, one of the, the interesting parts was, as it's cracking passwords, um, and this was running on a, a Hikvision, uh, fairly expensive security camera made in China, uh, when it cracked, you'll notice this password that it cracked, it says root, and then it says do how, I believe. Does anybody know what do how means without Googling it? It's Chinese for default. <laughs> so I, I, had a, I had a good laugh at that. I was like, okay, we all said, you know, hey, you said the password is default. So they did it. They just did it in Chinese. Um, I, I don't know. I thought that was hilarious. Um, but yeah, and it, it, it dumps, it's a little bit more resource intensive, but it's super tunable. So like I, would, there's, I had jobs that would run for three days straight and I was like, okay, this is you know, intense. And then you realize it's doing YAR rules against every single file in the firmware image, which, and it's running three or 4,000 of them at a time. So you can kind of fiddle with it and tune it and, and customize it for what you care about. In some cases, maybe you don't care about the common weaknesses. Maybe you don't really care about um, if it's doing like deep searches for credentials, um, stuff like that. So I think it's fun. It's, uh, I'm looking forward to it getting better. I've worked with the guy a bunch uh, finding bugs and sending him things that need to be fixed. And he's a super nice dude and responds within like a day, which is Germany day, cool. So some of the research challenges, I well, there goes the firmware again. Okay, man, I'm just cursed right now. <laughs> so. Some of the research challenges I found, and when I say challenges, I downloaded about 300 firmware images from a ton of different vendors just to try to get a big, broad swath of stuff to look at. Um, proprietary formats, right? There's tons of companies who their firmware images, Binwalk doesn't know what it is. Um, and so, you know, I run it in there and try to analyze it. It just gives me back an empty, an empty um, response. I start trying to figure out what the file is, and it's just some weirdly packaged thing, like the Crestron uh, projectors that are probably running up there. They use some weird arcane thing. Um, most of the uh, the Johnson Security Control Company or security stuff, or sorry, UPSs, use these weird formats. Um, a lot of the companies that don't use weird formats will then use AES S box, which is I'm not going to try to explain it because I don't really understand it, but it's basically encrypting the file inside the image so you can't read it. Some of them are doing simple things. I found one where you basically opened the bin file and it was a tar file and it had a password on it. I was like, well, that's cool, but I wasn't going to waste my time cracking it. Um, but then a lot of them um, will do reseller only access, right? And so I was just doing this as a research project. Uh, a lot of these companies won't let you get the firmware unless you're a reseller for the company, um, which means even you as an end user can't necessarily get the firmware image if you're worried about it. So you have to talk to the reseller, see if they'll give it to you. They're locking this stuff up, um, and I don't think that that's a good idea, right? This, the, a couple of weeks ago, this article came out about uh, Red Balloon, and they had found a uh, pretty severe vulnerability in Siemens PLCs, right, of Stuxnet fame. Um, the problem there is, the no thing I noticed was that these guys spent a year basically figuring out how to crack this firmware's uh, security. Um, or this image's security, and they know far more about this than I do. So if that's the kind of bar for entry, if it's taking people a year just to be able to look at it, and then when they look at it, they find some egregious vulnerabilities in it, like this is, we know that security through obscurity doesn't work, right? But in this firmware world, that seems to sort of be where people are. They're like, if we just keep it secret, nobody will look at it, you know, we're all fine here, I'm fine, how are you, right? Um, the other thing that was annoying was app-based updating. And I get it, you know, people are busy, they don't want to have to deal with putting in a USB, but a lot of these companies, things like conference room phones, projectors, uh, pr printers, of course, you run an app, it talks to your device, it tells you what firmware version it's on, it goes and downloads it from the manufacturer, it loads it for you. Uh, short of trying to set up like an intercepting proxy and dump the data out of a Wireshark capture, like, once again, this isn't easy for anybody to look at, right? and they're not making this easy for it to be um, reviewable. One of the things I think is cool about that Sonic project um, is that it's open source, right? You can go to GitHub, you can look at this stuff. If you're building a huge data center or you're looking to migrate your networking gear to something that's more open, um, you can actually go and assess this. You can probably point some of these code analysis tools that look at the source code and look for flaws, right? You can do that and get some assurance that what you're running in your network is actually secure. 
Um, even the, the load balancer vendors, some of them will download an ISO image. You can put that thing in there and see just how old the versions of Perl and Python are. Um, but this stuff isn't happening. And then VxWorks, not a bad thing about VxWorks, but it's RTOS. Um, the other thing about these two tools that I forgot to mention is they're Linux-based. So when you're talking about like RTOS, it doesn't really know what to do with that. It can't, it's, it's designed, really they were designed for looking at you know, your Netgear routers and your Asus routers and your sort of IoT stuff. I was trying to sort of repurpose it to look at the more arcane things. So it wasn't a surprise to me to find these research challenges, but um, it, it was what it was. I'm, I'm probably gonna keep doing this and maybe I'll be back next year to talk about how I broke these things, which would be fun. One of the cool things I found last week, and I got to stick this slide in right at the end, was um, ChatGPT. And I know some people are all be rolling their eyes like, oh, geez, another ChatGPT reference. Um, trust me, I'm one of those people. Um, but a friend of mine, Juan, who works for Sentinel-1, one, one of the world's, probably one of the world's best malware reversers, um, he did a class uh, at the Alperovich Institute, which is, uh, I believe, a sort of a group inside of Johns Hopkins. Um, it's sort of a cybersecurity think tank, like Dmitry Alperovitch from CrowdStrike, obviously it's named after him. Um, but what they did is they did a class, a week-long malware analysis class, and Juan took a piece of malware he'd never looked at um, and brought a bunch of students in. Some of them were technical, some of them weren't, and said, hey, the prerequisites is just read the first 14 chapters of practical malware analysis, which I'm like, that's a pretty heavy prerequisite. Um, but basically when he taught the class, he said, look, we're gonna teach this, I'm gonna walk you through reversing this stuff. Everybody have chat GPT open in a window, and if you have a question, if you get stuck, if you need more explanation, just ask chat GPT. Um, I know, right, you don't think that would work. It did. See, he was, he basically, his, this, this blog that's linked at the bottom, I really think it's, I think this is gonna be a really powerful tool as like a learning assistant. Right? He said his students were able to learn faster. They were able to not interrupt the flow of class by asking like sort of the noob questions, like the questions I would ask, like I don't understand what EAX versus ECX means. Um, but they were able to learn faster and by the end of it, he was like, yeah, almost every single student was able to successfully reverse this piece of malware. So with that in mind, last week one of my engineers comes to me and says, hey, we've got this library of like 4,000 Cisco ISO images. They all have a firmware image inside them and we wanna unpack it so we can analyze the firmware. However, Cisco uses this weird little tool that is what's, uh, it decrypts the, the firmware out, out, of the, um, out of the image. So he's like, can you reverse it? I'm like, I'll give it a college try. Never went to college, but I'll still do it. Um, so I throw it into Ida Free. And I see this, I start digging around and I find this function called FWDEC. And I was like, that sounds like firmware decrypt. So I just go copy the assembly, paste it into ChatGPT, and I'm like, what does this code do? And as you can see, it's saying there, it's a sequence of assembly instructions that's moving data into uh, memory. And these are ASCII codes. And so I'm like, print the characters. So it spits out this little output here. And I'm like, minus K something. That sounds like a key to me. And I've kind of, and it's a little blurry for you in the back, but that's the lower half of the function where it's spitting out this key. So then I go and say, okay, well, let me look at the rest of the function. And it's basically OpenSSL, ENC, AES 256 CBC. It's the entire OpenSSL decryption command that they just stuck into the code. So I pull this command out and then I use it on the other piece of, the other tool version, send them both to my dev. And the next morning he's like, dude, that worked. He's like, we decrypted all 4,000 of them in like an hour. This took me about an hour of time. I have used IDA like three or four times in my life. So I was just like, wow. This is a really cool way, and I'm trying to figure out ways to, to use this more for taking apart firmware images. Um, I haven't asked it about AES S-Box yet, but we'll see what it does. Although I have all these guide, like guide rails that it's putting on, and I hope Microsoft, please don't, please don't break it since you guys are putting money into it. <laughs> all right, I'm getting a little short on time, but I am only between you and lunch, so I can't be rude to the next presenter. Um, here be dragons. Here's some of the stuff I was able Dude, it's stuck. It's Skynet, man. Um, so some of the stuff I was able to find uh, from these images, um, and a lot of these I had to look at were fairly old, right? A lot of these companies, I would find old images where I could unpack it, and then the new versions were now encrypted and secured and completely inaccessible. So on this one hand, it's old, but on the other hand, if you built a data center in the last 20 years, you're probably running 10-year-old gear. So it's probably running old firmware. So IPKVM terminal servers. 
Uh, this is an Ethernet to serial adapter. Um, there's a lot of them plugged into the internet. Uh, one of the things I found as I was digging through the firmware images was somebody at Lantronics decided that it would be a good idea to password protect the access to their IPKVM device, but then also allow you to display the password in the logon banner. And then people plug these into the internet. So you go on Shodan and you can find thousands of these things that have the password just sitting there waiting for you. Um, that was disturbing. The other one I found was this, one of these devices had a bunch of accounts that were not documented in their, in their user documentation that when you logged in, it had a shell script as the default shell. Now some of these were just like, it just ran a normal command, but I did find one um, where it was using ping and then just percent variable. Now for the non-initiated to bash scripting, you're supposed to quote that. Um, if you don't quote that, I can just type in IP address semicolon command and it'll run whatever command I just gave it. So, yeah. Um, these are plugged into the internet, remember that. Uh, and lots of them, almost everything has Heartbleed. Uh, almost every single device I looked at was vulnerable to Heartbleed, which is what, eight years old at this point? Security cameras and cell phone routers, cellular uh, uh, KVM routers, or sorry, cellular serial routers. Um, shell shock, I was kind of surprised to find that. Um, obviously heart bleed, but default credentials everywhere. Um, this, that camera you're seeing, there, that's actually the same one that had the Chinese default password. Um, that's why I say fact sometimes misses things. For whatever reason, Emba cracked it in Chinese, fact only cracked it in English. Um, but these things have default creds. This Lantronics device I've never heard of, it's like four or $5,000 device that you plug a cellular uh, SIM into, and then you can connect over a cellular network and terminal into your machines in some remote location, which sounds like what you would use for, I don't know, wind power or things that don't have connections like hardwired. Um, and then SMB vulnerabilities, mostly Samba, but like full remotely, remotely exploitable um, because you sometimes want to be able to just connect to the camera over SMB. I don't really know why you would, but it's there. And yes, they turn them on too. That's the thing that's fun with these is it pulls the init scripts out. So you can see what is it starting up when it boots and <laughs> access control. Um, this one, there's actually a big Trellix blog about this. Um, this is a Linnell door control. So one of your badge readers that opens your door security systems. Uh, Trellix found an RCE in this that would allow people just to hack in and basically take over your door security system. Um, so I ran an older version of the image. Well, I don't know if it was older. I ran a version of the image through. Once again, found default credentials. Once again, found ancient Linux uh, kernel. Um, these things are almost impossible to get firmware images for. When I looked at Trellix's blog, oops, um, Trellix actually had to pull it off with hardware. Um, so the other interesting thing is that because these things are only looking at Linux components, this wouldn't have been able to tell me if it was running the vulnerable version of Linnell software because the vulnerability is not going to be in one of the SBOM detected components. So there's that limitation too. And then these are all the vendors that I couldn't test because they locked their firmware up. And trust me, I tried. <laughs> so yeah, all of these, you probably recognize these companies if you've ever built any sort of data center or any sort of company has these things in them, KVMs, controllers, power supply systems, backups, Honeywell does security systems. Um, yeah, it's, so it's just unnerving to me that there's this huge attack surface of stuff that runs physical things. You know, like if somebody was able to hack into like a Halon system in a data center, like that's, that's a bad situation if someone can control your fire suppression systems, like either turn them off so they don't work on a fire or turn them on when there's people inside the room, right? This is all stuff that we don't know about because it's really hard to look at. And that is basically that. Like I said, I'm not going to close on a super positive note. Um, but everything runs firmware. Everything on a network is a target. Um, this is not going to change. This is going to continue to get worse. Um, I would like to see vendors being held more accountable. I don't know how, how that, what that looks like. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is we're moving to a world where everything we do is controlled by a computer at some, like, some point. Um, and if we're not going to look for these things, it's everybody, else, the bad guys are, right? They're going to constantly be looking for ways to shut down our infrastructure. If I can stop a bridge from opening or closing, if I can shut down an airport, like this is going to continue. And if we're not able to look at this as security researchers, like how are we ever going to get ahead of that? So with that, thank you. I hope you've had fun and enjoy your lunch.